Okay. Hello, I'm Charlesy Keeler, president of the League of Women Voters of Lane County. Welcome to our speaker series brought to you on third Thursdays of the month. We come to you virtually with help from Rhonda Livesey, Terry Parker, and Nancy Mills. Thank you all for helping. We live on the traditional land of the Kalapuya people, whose descendants are citizens of both the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde community and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon. We honor the land and the people who have cared for it and reaffirm our commitment to steward and honor the land through our league's work. After the speaker presentation, we'll have time for some questions. You can begin to ask now and, and as they come to mind via the Q&A. We'll save them for later. All right, onward to our speaker. But first, I'm gonna introduce him after I get my cursor where I need it to be. KLCC has been on the air since 1967, serves more than 88,000 listeners each week, is consistently ranked among the top five public radio stations in the nation for market impact, and is a charter member of National Public Radio. KLCC's mission statement says they wish to engage the mind, enrich the spirit, and deepen understanding of our community and our world. Jim Rondo became KLC's general manager on June the 10th of 2019. At that time, he, he expressed his enthusiasm in an interview with Los Angeles media by saying, KLCC is number two in the market with a tremendous team that won three regional Murrow awards just last month. And you can't go wrong with a station that runs its own brew fest. <laughs> Indeed, Rondo came to Eugene from Southern California where he co-managed radio and television stations, including the partnership of non-commercial KSBR of Saddleback College and KCSN of Cal State Northridge. His broadcasting career includes stops in Seattle, San Diego, and Los Angeles. His successful run at NPR affiliate KCLU earned him the Los Angeles Press Club Award for Best Radio Anchor two years in a row. Commercial broadcasting highlights include Gavin Station of the Year honors at KRUZ Santa Barbara, afternoon host at KCBS FM Los Angeles, and anchor slash reporter at Le the legendary CBS news outlet KNX. Jim considers KLCC one of the jewels of the public radio system. He says the passion and dedication of its staff and volunteers combined with the support from Lane Community College exemplify community service at its best. Under his management, KLCC in 2020 was awarded two regional Edward R. Murrow awards and in 2021 was awarded five. Since beginning his work at KLCC, the station has also won multiple awards from Native American Journalists Association. Congratulations. And as a child, his family lived in Eugene before moving to Everett, Washington. So for him, he felt like it was coming home and was eager to be back in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. Welcome home, Jim. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for speaking to our League of Women Voters of Lane County. I um, am honored. Thank you so much. No, I, I appreciate the invitation. And, uh, and that, that's a lot of stuff. And that's a lot of me taking credit for the work of some really great people in our building. So I always hesitate about some of that. Um, but we do have a, we have a wonderful team here and we're uh, as, a, as I will uh, expound upon a bit, we're working to expand that team um, uh, quite a bit. And I, I'm particularly glad to be talking with the league because uh, I can't tell you as a media organization during the course of a year, how many people come to us and want in some way or other for us to get involved with getting the word out about something political, whether it's an issue or a candidate. And one of the first things out of my mouth almost always is, so is the League of Women Voters involved with this? Because it is such a, a reassurance for us that there is a nonpartisan motive to the, to the event or to the communication in some way. And uh, I think I really do feel like there's a lot of affinity between our values as a media organization and the work that you all do. So uh, I, I appreciate the invitation very much. I do have... Um, uh, just uh, some slides that I'm gonna put on the screen if I can, because that way you don't have to just sit and look at me the entire time. And uh, I'm gonna 
kind of cover the waterfront, uh, as they say, in terms of, of topics um, to talk about KLCC and about digital, uh, the digital age and, and some of the things that journalistic organizations are facing right now. And I'm happy to uh, narrow it down and, and take your questions about whatever you, you may be interested in as, uh, as we uh, finish up here. So uh, this is just a familiar site to begin for a lot of people in Eugene, the, uh, the uh, antenna farm up on the top of Blanton, the antenna on the far, the, the taller one on the left, uh, I think it is, is where KLCC's 89.7 signal comes from. Uh, we have nine other FM transmitters around the state uh, from Bend to Roseburg and then over to the coast, uh, so some familiar facilities. It's an old technology, but it's still working. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if I can go to the next one here, it was just over a year ago that uh, Modern Broadcasting celebrated its 100th birthday, and I, I just kind of love this fact as a radio geek. KDKA, which is, uh, was a radio station at the time owned by the Westinghouse Corporation, signed on the air to cover the, the Harding-Cox election returns. And um, that was uh, November 2nd of 1920. And I, I just kind of like to say that it's uh, one of the oldest forms of social media. Um, it was the beginning of the start of a lot of communal experiences that people have had with radio and then later with uh, television over the year before over the years before the internet ever even came to be uh, that connection with the human voice and, and human emotion uh, from the world world war ii reporting through the moon landing to the kennedy assassination and uh, so much more in contemporary times so uh, it, it's interesting that radio is doing so well over 100 years after its uh, after its birth as a matter of fact uh, it is the most consumed electronic media in the U.S. Um, about 243 million U.S. adults still listen to the radio each week. That dipped a little bit during the pandemic, but all the figures show that it's starting to come back. Uh, we know that it's probably not going to hold out forever with more people finding podcasts and digital sources and that kind of thing. But for now, anyway, good old fashioned radio is doing well and su surprises a lot of people to know that it's actually uh, in terms of uh, the reach, more popular than television even uh, in, in recent years. So uh, we are bracing ourselves for tablets and smartphones and uh, other devices that we don't even know about yet to uh, take a piece of that pie, but so far so good for radio. And uh, it still is by, by far the uh, number one source of entertainment people are currently using in cars. And again, during the pandemic, we saw a little bit of a drop off in the number of people who were commuting to work in the morning. Uh, a lot of those people are now back and consuming the news in the morning. We're starting to see them come back. But even uh, during 2021, about 75% uh, uh, of people that commuted used radio in their cars. KLCC is uh, an educational broadcaster. I don't like to take for granted that everyone knows that or has stopped to even think about what that means because it's our business and not all of yours. Uh, so I just like to stop and, and emphasize that. Uh, the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967 set aside space specifically for non-commercial uh, broadcasting on radio and television with the idea that not everything good is necessarily driven by a, a for-profit model. Uh, KLCC, as uh, Charles C. said, uh, was licensed to Lane Community College back in 1967. Uh, back then, a lot of colleges and universities got radio licenses, even though they didn't really have any idea at the time what in the world they would do with them. Uh, and it's worked out well for us, uh, as you said, because we have a, a community that has responded well to uh, to public broadcasting and what public broadcasting has become. Uh, we are a mission-driven organization, and as you said, uh, driven by the values of engaging the mind, enriching the spirit, and, and deepening understanding. And we can do that because we are funded by members. Uh, we have people who give $10, $20, $15 a month. Others that give a one-time amount every year. We have some wonderful family and community organizations that provide grants uh, and some business supporters as well that you'll hear acknowledged on the radio. The big difference uh, as far as the business is concerned is that you will never hear anyone making a claim or telling you that you can get the lowest interest rate or a limited time sale or anything like that on public broadcasting. That is against the rules. We wouldn't want to do it anyway. But uh, FCC rules put strict uh, language guidelines and what advertisers can say, and it's uh, it's more or less confined to identifying the source of the funding, 
uh, if it's a local car dealer or whatever it may be, uh, and, and what they're in business to do, but, but that's really the extent of it so that you know where the, where the financial uh, support is coming from. And, and hopefully they will uh, get that, uh, that sort of um, glow that comes from being associated with public broadcasting. <laughs> and uh, some of them tell us that they, they'd like to uh, support KLCC for, for that reason, in addition to the fact that they're just philanthropic. Um, the Public Broadcasting Act, we think, has led to a lot of very good things as a result of not uh, uh, requiring everything on the dial to be driven by commercial concerns. A couple of the things on the screen are specifically provided by KLCC in this community, all things considered. Uh, one of the earliest uh, public radio magazine programs still airs on KLCC decades later. Uh, morning Edition is our flagship morning broadcast. And of course, This American Life with Ira Glass is uh, another program that uh, ha has won Peabody Awards and just about every other award for, for journalism. And still to this day, uh, both in its broadcast and online component, does some really tremendous work that would only have been nurtured by public broadcasting. That, that is, of course, in addition to uh, the great musical performances that you uh, you find on public television, uh, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood and uh, Sesame Street for children's programming and great uh, programs like, like Nova, for example, as well. Um, we know a lot about our audience and here's just a national snapshot of who they are. Very educated, involved people. They are people who vote uh, for this organization. 77% uh, voting rate may seem low, but uh, it's higher than a lot of other uh, segments of the population. So we're, we're proud of our folks for that being um, very civically uh, involved. These are people who um, support and are consumers of art and culture. Uh, the reason I, I point out uh, the difference between uh, commercial and non-commercial considerations is not because uh, commercial media is, is full of bad people. <laughs> it's not. My brother is a TV news producer in Los Angeles and uh, is uh, proud of the work he does and is driven by a, a personal commitment to get it right. And a lot of people are. Uh, it's just that, uh, as a matter of fact, probably most, if not uh, a lot of what we know about our world does come from uh, commercial reporters and producers and uh, commercial organizations. But uh, digital media has really changed the game. Uh, if you just pick up any local newspaper across this country, the want ads and the grocery store circulars and the automotive sections that used to be in there that would support the news coverage that you would get in local communities. For the most part, that does not exist anymore. So much of it has gone off and uh, in the digital age is, is uh, instead uh, funding that's going to Facebook and Google and other sources, the local newspaper and uh, to a lesser extent, the local TV and, and radio outlets that used to rely on that kind of financial support just aren't getting it anymore. And it has really considerably diminish the resources that all of these organizations have to put into covering local news, to providing sources of, of uh, cultural uh, and inspirational um, programming. That advertising supported model that has worked for years and years and years uh, uh, for the newspaper and, and even commercial television and radio industry is under, under terrible strain these days. And uh, because KLCC is a non-commercial organization, we feel a special obligation to step in and where we can to provide a bit of what has been lost in terms of resources because of our different funding model. I threw this slide in because it's um, uh, something we put together a while back uh, and it kind of just makes me laugh. Um, I'm asked occasionally as the, the manager of a, a public uh, radio station, why public broadcasting should exist at all. Uh, occasionally someone will make the point that they believe that if the Consumers want it, the market will uh, will provide it, and that's the way it should be. And I just kind of semi-jokingly point to cable television in the 80s and 90s when there was really a renaissance of, uh, of channels. And we were, we were all told that we would have the Arts and Entertainment Channel and Bravo for Fine Arts and Opera and the History Channel telling us about our past and how we got here today. And then, you know, the commercial considerations kick in. There's just a need to attract more ears and eyeballs to the screen. And... These days, uh, A&E is the home of the ghost hunters and programs like Hoarders. Uh, if you want to watch the Real Housewives of whatever county, you tune to Bravo. Uh, the History Channel features great, some great history programming occasionally, but then also things like Swamp People and Pawn Stars and Ancient Aliens. And uh, it just is kind of a, 
uh, a joking example of uh, of what happens when things are driven purely by by commercial considerations. So today, by somewhat happy accident, KLCC uh, operating under this non-commercial model that a lot of people still to this day will tell us that really shouldn't work. Um, going on the air and asking people to fund things that they don't have to pay for. Um, it's working well for us, uh, partially because we're in just such a great community. Every year, our uh, journalists here at KLCC file hundreds of local stories for broadcast and the web. It might even be in the thousands some years. Um, as Chelsea said, we were order, uh, awarded the overall uh, excellence um, award for our newsrooms our size by the Radio and Television Digital News Association. I believe it's two and maybe three years in a row now, uh, in addition to a lot of uh, uh, accolades for specific stories. It means a lot to us that our entire team has been uh, recognized for their, for their good work and what they put on the air and, and increasingly what they put online. In the last uh, couple of years, we've had uh, a lot of special reporting uh, some series and documentaries and um, uh, special town hall kinds of broadcasts on uh, specifically issues of race and Oregon education and the environment and a number of others. And um, we recently got word that uh, in the fall ratings period, which was uh, covering September, October, November of uh, 2021, KLCC was actually the top rated uh, radio station in its Western Oregon survey area, um, which is a great, uh, a great thing that we love to brag about while it lasts. Um, and um, we uh, usually uh, share that honor with a couple of other stations being on the top of the heap. So uh, we enjoy it, but we really think it's uh, uh, really an indication of the community we're in more than anything. And the fact that they, re they resonate with the, the kind of values that uh, drive the, the work that we do. Here's just a quick map um, for those who still listen via traditional radio, all those green circles are transmitters uh, that carry KLCC from uh, central Oregon all the way to the coast. Um, you can listen on the on the radio, and then if we were to draw a map with circles where everyone can listen uh, via a smart speaker or a computer or anything else, the entire globe of, would of course be green, uh, because increasingly we're not just a radio station anymore, but we're delivering news in various forms uh, all over the state. I, uh, I mentioned our, our feeling of commitment in our shop here toward uh, expanding what we can do in terms of local reporting and um, uh, you may hear in the next year or so as it becomes more public about a, a campaign that we have uh, put together uh, that we've been running kind of quietly behind the scenes to um, get the word out about really journalism and, and the threat to journalism in, in local communities and specifically uh, right here in, in Western Oregon. Um, and, and then the other part of that, of course, is to raise funding for our um, expansion efforts overall. Uh, it features a quote here on the bottom from Margaret Sullivan, who is a media columnist for the Washington Post and uh, prior to that, uh, a pioneering uh, editor of the Buffalo News and the former public editor of the New York Times. And she said in a recent book that she, uh, she authored, this is the truest crisis in American news media that so many places are losing the institutions that gather the news that bind the community together, that hold public officials accountable and bring public concerns visibility. And that's kind of the uh, central organizing statement uh, of this campaign that, uh, that we're running here called Amplifying Oregon uh, Voices. There are some really uh, shocking numbers, probably, probably not all that surprising actually, uh, for, for those who do know how uh, the digital age has changed things and has uh, have noticed uh, what used to be available from local news sources and, and isn't now. But uh, just between 2008 and, and 2017, about 45% of print journalism jobs were lost. And there was an acceleration of that during the, uh, the pandemic. There were 36,000 COVID-related cuts, furloughs, or reductions. Uh, we don't have the, the final numbers yet on that, but it's very likely a lot of those jobs aren't going to be coming back. Here in our state, uh, there used to be 80 to 100 people covering the uh, Oregon um, capital. That press corps has dwindled down to uh, really just a handful now. There's probably 13 to 15 uh, now uh, covering regularly what goes on in, in the Oregon Capitol. Uh, 1,800 newspaper closures and mergers between 2004 and, and 2015. And again, those uh, numbers are, are probably still, uh, still climbing. 
and 50% of US counties only have one newspaper. In many ways, we here uh, in our region are doing better than the country as a whole in terms of the uh, resources that we have available to us to, to find out what's going on in our world. And there's a lot of strong academic research um, that we look to as a mission-driven organization as, uh, as really bad news uh, when it comes to the decline of uh, the local news ecosystem, both here and, and nationally. Uh, because when you don't have a lot of strong local news outlets, um, research shows you have fewer people running for public office. People don't vote at the rate that they used to vote at because they don't feel like they know what's going on. And the cost of government goes up because you don't really have a watchdog uh, looking over your shoulder as an elected official or as an uh, administrator to make sure that you're spending uh, the public's money efficiently and uh, that, that accountability just, uh, just isn't there. I will just, uh, just as an aside, I'd also mention that uh, there's uh, a real nationalization of discourse that's been noted uh, in recent years, and uh, this is particularly true. Uh, it, it's true on our air occasionally too, as a as a national public radio affiliate, uh, where we try to supplement the stories that are uh, produced by the network on a national level with local reporting. But uh, a lot of people these days are getting their news from places like CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or cable news sources. They're, just about every network now has some sort of streaming or, or cable news source. You're getting the stories that are uh, really hot button national issues, but the chances are unless there is a catastrophic event or a major scandal of some kind, you're probably not hearing about much of what's going on at, on a local level in Oregon on CNN or any of those outlets. Uh, they do a very good job of what they do nationally, but if uh, the local news gathering ecosystem is, is hollowed out by fewer reporters, fewer producers um, in communities like Eugene, Springfield, and Bend, and uh, uh, all Douglas County, and, and all over the areas that we serve, there's just um, less chance that uh, the community is going to know about the conversations that are happening that are important to them, things about uh, local zoning, local local elected officials, uh, education issues, and just so many other things. On a more positive note, though, uh, we take pretty seriously around here our value uh, as a uh, one of the organizations locally that has a platform to put things on the agenda and contribute positively to a community discourse. When you do have journalism that is doing its job, uh, you have better governance. Uh, increased economic investment because the people who are spending the money believe it'll be well spent, appreciation for cultural diversity because you have uh, reporters introducing you to people that you may never have a chance to meet, knowing about uh, community celebrations and like that uh, you likely wouldn't know about unless somebody were out there covering them. Um, there's higher voter uh, participation and studies show that uh, there's less polarization because people start talking about issues, individual issues, rather than about uh, left and right and political parties and uh, framing it that way. Uh, so we really believe that uh, one of the things that we can do is contribute to a, a more cohesive community by uh, being a convener of, of uh, civic dialogue. So our, uh, our campaign, this is a little bit of inside baseball stuff for you, but we have uh, as, a, as an organization that was started in 1967 as a radio station, um, we are building into not just a radio station, but a multimedia organization, something that you'll be able to uh, tune into on the radio, yes, but also find on your, uh, on your uh, palm held, handheld device, uh, on your desktop, uh, via your smart speaker, any number of other places. And so that means uh, the need to modernize an infrastructure that was designed to run a 24 hour radio station, but wasn't designed to be a digital newsroom necessarily. Um, so we're, we're, we're in the process of doing that uh, right now. Um, more and more people are just expecting um, that delivery of information to wherever they are. And if it's on a mobile device, then we need to have apps and things ready for the mobile device. So uh, digital platform expansion is a big uh, issue for us, but really by far the biggest investment is the creation of local content that reflects the, the people and the issues, the sights and uh, sounds of, of Oregon that you wouldn't find anywhere else unless there was a local newspaper or local radio station out there, uh, out there creating it. So that's what uh, I'm, really proud of uh, the team that we have now for being able to do really uh, 
on sometimes some days a shoestring um, with fewer people than we actually need, but we have a hard, hardworking, uh, great group of folks who are out there doing it. Our digital expansion very recently has included the redesign of our website to increase its ability to um, deliver local information. We're still working on some layout issues and that kind of thing, but the entire backend infrastructure of uh, our website at klcc.org has been recreated um, and has uh, really a much more powerful capacity than it ever has to respond to news uh, events, breaking news and, and that kind of thing, but also to provide graphical information, video information, uh, uh, you name it, live, uh, live streaming, both video and audio. Uh, it's basically a, a TV station, a radio station, a newspaper, all uh, wrapped into one. In addition to the uh, 80 to 100,000 listeners a week that KLCC brings uh, over or reaches over the air, we also just ran some numbers recently and found that we had 1.2 million people go to our website last year. Uh, and so uh, we, we definitely see the value of uh, digital delivery of information. And just as an aside, you know, during the Oregon wildfires uh, a few years ago, uh, we, we, we saw the really the incredible value of live radio, which is sometimes overlooked. The ability to talk to people right now about what's happening right now and respond in the moment in a way that you can't do on a podcast if it's pre-recorded. Um, so that was that was really a uh, kind of reaffirmed our faith in the idea that there's still some value in that old fashioned technology, but also the ability to reach over a million people with the information that they value online when and where they want it. Uh, that's that's a different model, but it's it's interesting and people are responding. We've recently added some uh, some podcasts that cover some topics uh, such as business uh, and culture, uh, the Oregon Rainmakers podcast which uh, our colleague Michael Dunn is, is producing and hosting for us, uh, is stepping in to talk to some community business leaders and um, some figures in, uh, uh, around the uh, economy of our region that wouldn't uh, really get a lot of extra time necessarily on uh, radio in, in the form of a newscast these days. And also uh, Barbara Dellenbach uh, is hosting for us a program called Oregon Grapevine. And those are just two uh, early forays into podcasting. The nice thing about podcasts is you can tailor them to people's interests and not have to worry about the fact that uh, there's a bit of a, a concern in live broadcasting over people's um, uh, attention span. How much time are they willing to listen for it's something that's not necessarily of interest to them right now before you move on to another uh, area. With podcasts, you don't have to worry about it because they're, they're telling you that they're interested by clicking on it. And we uh, are increasingly hosting uh, online forums and events, although some of that is necessitated by COVID and we sure wish that we could do some things in person real soon. So we're hoping that uh, by this summer, we'll be able to get out and actually talk to people in, in person. We are in the process right now of adding to our reporting staff. This is uh, thanks to some grant funding from some uh, wonderful community organizations, one of which is the uh, WLS Spencer Foundation, which has been, uh, they've been just really tremendously generous to us. Uh, last, well, actually 2020 now, we added a multimedia journalist to our team to help us um, accelerate our growth in some of the areas that I mentioned, adding video and uh, graphical um, display to our website in a way that a bunch of old radio pros necessarily are, aren't necessarily ready to do, uh, but we are more and more adding to the skill set of our newsroom. And uh, another, uh, another effort that is underway right now, and I'm really very excited about it, is that uh, as much as we love to cover the day and date news of the community, and we are investing in that, uh, there's a whole uh, other range of discussion that uh, may not be about things that are headline news items of the day, but the community needs to talk about. And we are creating what we're calling a public affairs unit. And that's partly because we don't want to use the word talk show, uh, because talk shows have gotten uh, somewhat of a bad name with uh, sort of the, the model that has increasingly been used for them, where it's a talking head talking about their political opinions. And that's not what we are doing. We are looking for a, a journalist um, and in the process of hiring a journalist to conduct a daily program where you will hear Oregon people and Oregon issues treated in a responsible way, uh, in an interactive way so that uh, the audience can ask questions and take issue if they would like to. 
Um, so that's uh, before the end of the year going to be a reality on our airwaves and also available available digitally for people to consume a more long form take on on big issues. And um, more and more emphasis on rural and representational issues, making sure our newsroom looks like the people that we're serving. Uh, that's a, a big and important uh, value, and it, it has been for a number of years here uh, at KLCC, and so we're continuing to work on that. Um, and then there are communities in Oregon that probably are never going to support a real thriving local radio station or TV station or even uh, even newspaper. If they can, great. But uh, there are a lot of important people in these communities that we think we need to reflect um, their concerns back to the, the greater community at large, in addition to serving them on a daily basis with, with the news. Uh, you know, there's a whole segment of our state that wants to become part of Idaho. Um, and it would behoove us all to, you know, know what it is that they're talking about. What, did, what are they taking issue with? And uh, so we're working to make sure that we're able to bring back those stories from places outside of Corvallis and Eugene and Springfield, where we think we're, we're pretty strong, but uh, not, not as strong as we'd like to be in some of the uh, more far-flung places. So that is kind of a, just a, a great overview of the things that we're working on, things that we, uh, we think are, are uh, a value for us right now. And I'd be happy to take any questions you have right now, uh, or feel free to jot down my email address if we can uh, chat one on one in, in one way or another, we're happy to do that as well. It's on, on your screen and, and be happy to, to email that out to anyone who has has an interest. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. That was that was wonderful presentation. Uh, in fact, it kind of um, answered my questions before I even got to express them. So uh, very informative, thank you. Um, I, we do have some questions here. Um, and one of them from Terry is, today's media environment requires reporters and editors to be detectives of misinformation and be prepared to debunk falsehoods without amplifying them. Uh, how does KLCC approach this news reality? Well, you know, public radio, this is, this is something we've always had is kind of the, um, we've had the luxury of time traditionally. And that is, mm -hmm. that has been a luxury we don't have as much anymore, uh, where we, we didn't necessarily have to get the story on fast. We got it on when we could get it right. Now, increasingly, because, uh, like, I should take a step back, you know, the, the old model used to be the local newspaper would report the story. And public radio would analyze the story and expand on the story after local print uh, reporters brought it, brought it home. Uh, with fewer people reporting for local newspapers these days, we increasingly are having to be the day and date um, gatherers of fact and not just the analyzers. It's kind of a new role for public media. We've been in it for a few years now. Um, but one of the ways that we're doing it is trying to bring in uh, enough reporters who can specialize on in a specific area, um, have someone whose specialty is the environment, uh, someone who specializes in education um, and, and you know, health uh, certainly with COVID-19 has been important. Um, and that is part of the value of adding to the newsroom to be able to have people who can detect uh, a falsehood when you, they're being told about an economic investment project that doesn't seem like it all adds up. Or, or something like that. And uh, we, we up to now have been able to allow reporters enough time to do the background work on those stories so that they, when they do go to the press conference or get the one-on-one -on -one inter interview, uh, have enough background to, to detect the falsehood, <laughs> to, uh, to play devil's advocate, which is something we want them to be able to do. But increasingly, as we are frontline uh, day and date fact gatherers, that's going to be more difficult without people who are specializing in, in, a, in a specific beat. Uh, we had uh, a reporter who just recently uh, left us, uh, Elizabeth Gabriel, who is really a great addition to our newsroom and left us to go to a, a great opportunity for her in uh, Indianapolis. Um, but one of her passions was, was education. And so she would go into an interview about anything involving education, knowing everything there was to know. Um, we have some, we have people now, um, Tiffany Eckert, who's our uh, primarily uh, uh, health reporter for us, knows pretty much um, the, the day's uh, stats about COVID or any other health issue. Uh, 
And, and we, have, we have a lot of reporters who are like that, who specify, uh, specialize in specific areas. And we're going to need in the future to do a lot more of that so that people go into an interview uh, with a factual basis to work from and are not trying to just learn on the fly in, in five minutes uh, what all of the uh, nuances are. That's wonderful. Um, we have another question. Um, have you given thought about how KLCC is going to engage in the upcoming election season, um, given how many candidates and changes are going to be in front of us? We, we have given thought to it. I don't know that we have any final answers. I mean, uh, I, I know we have uh, some ambitions to conduct uh, some candidate forums uh, both on the air and with some partner organizations. Um, uh, City Club of Eugene is, is doing some candidate forums. And I know uh, our journalists have been engaged to uh, moderate some of those. It's, it's gonna be a really kind of a wild year. And, and right now we're also, uh, we're also involved with some efforts to just take the temperature of voters about what it actually is that they are interested in hearing from the candidates so that the reporters will be asking the right questions. Uh, to inform voters, so we don't have any we don't have any final answers. But Rachel McDonald, our, our news director, is is leading the charge on that uh, in terms of what the news department is going to be doing, and and we should have some answers fairly soon as to what the calendar of events will be. Part of it will uh, part of it will be as it always is. What is already available? What you know? What sorts of forums and opportunities League of Women Voters will provide? Um, and for us, uh, we are also concerned about making sure that um, we provide good coverage of, of issues that aren't necessarily central to Eugene and, and Springfield here that uh, uh, are important to Douglas County and are important to uh, Lynn and, and Benton County and Deschutes County and uh, Lincoln County and the other places that we cover. So um, it's actually a bigger challenge than it even would be if we were a local newspaper because the geographical coverage that we have uh, lends itself to some obligations to um, uh, provide information to people that aren't living in our backyard here. Well, the League of Women Voters has many um, branches in all of your... Uh, <laughs> yeah, where, where, you, where you're heard. And so if we can be of assistance, I can't speak for the others, but certainly for Lane County, if we can be of assistance, let us know. Um, we, we, uh, we always... We always try to weigh whether or not our best, um, the best use of our resources is to get the word out about things that other people are doing or try to do them ourselves. Right. Uh, and, and the test is, can we do it well? <laughs> so, but, it, but in other cases, if we notice something that just isn't happening because there isn't a local organization on the story or, or invest in, in the, uh, the political contest in one way or another, I, again, it's one of those situations where we sometimes feel like, well, we have an obligation to put resources there. So, right. um, and Ellen asks, are there many public radio stations that are number one in their markets? Do you know, offhand? There are a few. In fact, I think Portland, our colleagues in Portland, Oregon Public Broadcasting, is number one in the market. Last I checked, um, it's a pretty normal course of events in places like, I believe, Boston. Uh, where WBUR is regularly on, on top. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't happen everywhere. Uh, you'll see other markets where the public radio station is number 20 or 25. Uh, so that's why I say it speaks, I think it speaks well to the kind of discourse that Oregonians as a whole are, are kind of gravitating toward almost as much as it does to anything we do, so. I remember a few years back um, that um, Portland had, was the drive time uh, King. Uh, so, I, and that, that made national news evidently. So that yeah. was one of the times that, uh, that happened. Um, okay. Um, oh, let me look at this. There's new research on how people process information and heightened awareness of how information spreads. How does that impact your way of doing business? Are we talking about misinformation? I wonder. Um, we, we we're very a little further. We are very um, tuned into increasingly. I mean, I guess I guess because of social media, because of email, there's an immediacy of the kind of response that we get as broadcasters. 
even for radio, which is uh, traditionally a kind of a one-way medium, uh, we hear back from people all the time, and it's 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 very interesting to hear people's uh, people's take on uh, reporting on COVID nineteen. Um, uh, we, yeah. will hear, we will hear from people who don't think the virus is real occasionally, um, things like that. And and then there's there's a there are some perceptions that we are very aware of. I, in fact, this is, this is just an interesting aside, oh, interesting to me anyway, because I work in this business. Um, there was, a, there was some, a study the other day that I was reading that said um, this term that we often like to use in public radio, that our journalists are storytellers. There's a certain number of people out there when they hear journalists called storytellers, they think literally we're making up the stories. So we have to be very careful about the way we frame what we do. And so uh, there's a lot of, I guess, different aspects to that question, but definitely um, hearing back from listeners helps us speak to where they are in terms of what they know and what they need to know. Um, and, and we've been very, uh, I think, acutely aware of that during uh, COVID-19 where there's just a, there's a lot of background that you have to know to understand what's going on with a pandemic. And we can't assume that everyone is tuned in all the time. So providing that background so that people understand what it is we're saying about the variants and the vaccinations and, uh, and wh whatever else may, may come next, uh, the effect, uh, effectiveness of mask wearing, uh, uh, that we're we're constantly kind of providing that background over and over again, or at least the what is known at that best best understood at that current time, um, so that so that we're kind of taking everyone along with us informationally and not leaving people behind. I hope that answers some of it. Well, and I, I must um, commend KLCC for what they did with COVID on Friday afternoons to help people understand what was going on locally and what was necessary the um i don't remember now what you call it um it's the friday weird. show <laughs> say what they was called the friday show oh yeah. cool do you have any plans when COVID is over of how to fill that well that's part of our uh yes our, our public affairs unit is going to pick up where that left off uh, and i will okay. say we we were very lucky here because we had access to a really uh a stellar public health professional in dr lukey who was able to take listener questions and boil it down and make sense of COVID. Um, and so we did get a lot of really good reaction and some really insightful questions from listeners during the course of that program. But that was an really a, an example to us of the need to do something longer form. Uh, you know, ordinarily during drive time for us, a long story is maybe four or five minutes uh, on a given topic. Sometimes they'll go longer, sometimes they'll be, you know, 10 if we need them to be. But um, there are, there are issues like, like COVID and environmental issues. And why did it get to be 130 last summer? You know, things that, that, that can be talked about um, that may not necessarily be in the headlines today, but uh, require a longer conversation, sometimes dialogue between people who disagree with each other. So that's why our public affairs unit, we're calling it, is gonna be producing a, an hour long program. Uh, it's similar to a program we air from uh, Oregon Public Broadcasting called Think Out Loud, which is currently on in the noon hour. But it, uh, what we are going to be doing is a uh, more Western Central Oregon focused version of that, more or less. Um, and that'll, that will pick up some of the long form engagement that the Friday show and other um, previous efforts uh, have, uh, have brought to the air for us. So we're, we're looking forward to getting that on the air. Hopefully this summer, the timetables slipping a little but um, we're we're working hard behind the scenes to get that done so it won't be a, a specific topic like covid it, it will vary from week to week or it will vary from yeah day to day um and, and oh, so it'll be every day it'll be every day that is that's the ultimate goal to get it on every weekday wow uh, for at least an hour and then there will also be some engagement components and a way to listen to it online for those who don't hear it don't hear it live very so. good. Um, here's a good one from June. Uh, she feels sorry for the people in Eastern Oregon who are outside of the Bend area um, and therefore have no access to OPB for another point of view. That's true of my hometown in Ohio. There are five places that can get 
Rush used to get Rush Limbaugh and only one uh, public radio station, which most of the time just played classical music. So there was there's no other opportunity or, or, or are we wrong? Is there an opportunity to get public radio broadcast in Eastern Oregon? Well, well we, yeah, we're in Bend and Sisters, uh, and then there are there are some repeaters in some fairly rural places. Uh, OPB has some some stations, and I'm not sure of the exact cities, but I'll tell you, uh, we we get into we get into sort of this this uh, thinking about the map and where we've got sticks and you know towers broadcasting things, and and then we always have to stop and tell ourselves we're anywhere the internet is these days. Right. Um, so if if you've yeah. got the internet in any form, you can listen to any station you want to anywhere in the world, which is kind of part of why it's so important for us to be local, because if you want to hear a national program, you can hear it from Washington, D.C. or Atlanta or any number of sources these days. Um, and so for us to be Oregon centric uh, is more important than it ever has been. And that's part of why we're putting such an em emphasis on local content creation so that you hear, you know, you hear your neighbor from Riddle on the air one day. Uh, uh, you're hearing Oregon people and Oregon issues that, you know, you just wouldn't find on a station from another city or from CNN or any national outlet. Uh, um, Freddie brings up this question I thought about too. Did you know if your million plus online users are mostly in-state or are they travelers? Do you have any idea about that? Yeah, we, we can we can narrow that down. Um, they the majority of them, I think it's a, about a million of them are in the United States. I, I couldn't tell you how many are in Oregon specifically. I would say probably the majority of them are in Oregon. Uh, we even had some some uh, users in in Europe. I mean, they're, they're all over the map. Um, the, the thing that was really heartening for us was when uh, well, again, during the Oregon wildfires, when we looked at the uh, the traffic we got from uh, the website and found, uh, I think I think at one point it was like half a million people inside the state uh, coming to our website for information about the the wildfires and where they were burning and then after and in the aftermath the recovery efforts and uh, and so I, we we think primarily we're serving Oregonians but we're also serving. Uh, Oregon, Oregon expats, uh, <laughs> people who have left the state, and we hear about it every year during the uh, the country fair that there are people, uh, you know, in Savannah, Georgia, who wish they were here for the country fair and tune in to to hear yeah. what's going on with the fair families. So yeah. it's it's a, it's it's pretty national, but mo for the most part, if people are finding KLCC, they're they're Oregonians. Very good. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and I was in. Paris for a couple of months, a couple of years back, just before COVID. And guess where I tuned into? I, I needed to know what the news was. And uh, so the internet uh, aspect of it must be an advantage for you to figure out what your listenership wants to know, uh, what direction you should take. Is that true or? I, I would say that's true and there's some danger to it uh, because, you know, we. We, we almost, we want to be guided by our mission and not by whether somebody's clicking on or off, uh, because that's really the, that's really the commercial model. <laughs> so we, we try not to be as guided by the daily ebb and flow of audience as, as all that. Um, it's, it's really more important to us that we, um, that we have people's trust so that they keep coming back than whether or not they listen for hours at a time, which is more of a commercial kind of concern. But it is interesting. I, I will tell you, like on uh, the morning of January 6th, pretty predictable um, that people would tune in in large numbers, for example, for the, for the coverage of the anniversary that day. Um, and to hear, hear the president speak on, on a given topic, you can, you can see that people are tuning in. Interestingly enough, uh, when Governor Brown was doing her regular um, COVID-19 press conferences, we would see people tune in to hear the press conferences, which seems like a really terrible, boring kind of radio, but it's important to people. Um, so, so we were happy to be able to, to, to run those and provide people access to it if they didn't have it somewhere else. So, um, I listened to the state of uh, the state uh, from Governor Brown. I listened to that. 
mostly because I wanted to do other things while I was uh, getting the news. I didn't have to stand in front of a television. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Um, have a compliment and then a question um, uh, from Lois. She appreciates uh, being able to hear different perspectives and opinions. Um, and she wants to know how important is the Oregon Cultural Trust to your organization? Do you get money from them? Do you get support? Uh, the Oregon Cultural Trust has been a, been very supportive to uh, to KLCC. Yes, Good. absolutely. Um, it's it's one of those things that's a little bit difficult for some people to figure out how that program works, um, and so we do um, make some effort to try to explain how uh, some aspects of it work. But yeah, it's and and I will say that having that in this state it makes us a little bit unique. Uh, because coming from California, you don't have anything quite like really? that to support wow. the arts. Uh, so it, it's really, really a, a welcome addition to our funding. Um, man, I'm, I'm re repeating here. Um, here's a good one, I think. Um, what are the other local news resources that you rely on to support the work of, uh, of ALCC? Oh, we're very aware of what pretty much most of the uh, other local reporters in town are doing. Of certainly, of what the Register Guard is is doing, we subscribe to the we subscribe to the newspapers. Um, I, we're, I think we're all fairly uh, aware of um, what is going on 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 the local television uh, news stations. Um, I will tell you one of the most important things and, and something I'm really grateful for is the collaboration that we have between the other public broadcasting um, organizations in this state. Another thing that's not, not entirely uh, present elsewhere, but we have a great relationship with Oregon Public Broadcasting and with our counterparts down in Ashland at, at Jefferson Public Radio. And um, I, we think it's, it's really going to serve the state well going forward because where, for example, JPR may put resources into covering a community, we don't necessarily have to because we're they're more than willing to share um, those resources with us when that reporter comes back with a with a big uh, news story. Uh, and the, the same, uh, you'll hear KLCC reporters in in Portland and uh, on the JPR stations out of Ashland too. So those are really, um, uh, uh, and, I, and I think the the coverage of the state capitol. Uh, maybe one place to really highlight that. KLCC does have a reporter um, uh, based in uh, Kaiser to report on the goings on of Salem, uh, but also of Corval Corvallis. Um, and he's only able to do so much, obviously, <laughs> as one person. Uh, but then being able to uh, editorially coordinate with Oregon Public Broadcasting, what resources, resources they're putting on a, a political story out of Salem, so that we don't necessarily have to if they're already covering it is, is really a, a great addition for us so that we can put resources where they're gonna generate, uh, add value uh, to the entire system and instead of all creating the same content. Um, but at the same time, we have kind of, a, we have a whole different group of editors and news directors who are criti critiquing the stories. So if somebody brings back a story with one perspective, someone's gonna say, hey, you left that out. Um, which is which is valuable as well. Interesting. Uh, uh, sort of a question that I had was, um, I was pleased because I'm not such a music fan to hear more talk on KLCC. Uh, what led to that decision? Well, uh, it, it's hard to explain. We don't necessarily program the station uh, as a radio station, thinking, well, it's talk versus music. Um, mm -hmm. It's more a decision of what the audience seems to value and what they could get somewhere else pretty easily. Um, my kind of unpopular perspective in some ways is that music, uh, unless it's locally recorded music, essentially is syndicated programming. Um, and our highest value is creating new content that you can't find on a CD, you can't download or listen to on your smart speaker. Uh, and you probably can't find uh, on another radio station just, just by flipping the dial. If you think about the radio dial as sort of a neighborhood, um, it doesn't make, well, or let, let's, let's say it's, it's Main Street. It doesn't make sense for everyone to open a delicatessen. Um, 
And, and KLCC is kind of unique. If you flip around the dial in most parts of the state, you may hear KLCC and, and OPB in, in some places. You might have two choices for news on the FM dial or some variation of public radio style programming. But for the most part, the entire, the rest of the dial is gonna be music. Um, and so music listeners have many more choices than news listeners. Uh, and so increasingly the, the response we get from people who are members and, and we think the ratings, another dirty word, we're not supposed to say ratings, but the audience data that we, uh, that we are able to look at shows us that when we put on um, mission driven, um, public radio style programming, the response of the audience is much stronger. And probably it's because uh, increasingly people, uh, if I want to hear, um, well, who knows? If, if, if I want to hear Shostakovich right now, I can ask my smart speaker to play it. Um, you don't have to wait for a radio station to play your favorite song anymore. And that's really going to be a, uh, a huge change in the way that um, radio stations are programmed in the future. So that's why we're focusing more on local content than anything else. Very good. That's going to disappoint our questioner, June, <laughs> who wants to know, uh, do you, how soon do you anticipate broadcasting the New York Metropolitan Opera? <laughs> I doubt we're going to be broadcasting the New York Metropolitan Opera. But if there is demand for that, there's a great classical station in Eugene called that's KWAX. Great. That would be probably that would be in their lane. We have uh, great colleagues uh, for more eclectic music programming at KRVM, which, you know, we have great respect for them. And we do have we still have some music programming that performs very well for us. Um, we have some jazz programming because you don't, you don't find jazz elsewhere. We have a, a folk program on Sunday afternoons, uh, the front porch that has just tremendous audience. Um, so we're not out of the music business. We're just mindful of what actually constitutes a, an alternative that you can't find elsewhere. And we're, we're more willing to be that alternative than to, to try to create a format around it. Okay. And here's sort of a technical question. Um, Lois wants to know, can you at any moment uh, uh, tell how many people are tuned in or is your information based on surveys? Uh, for radio listening, it's based on a survey that happens twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the most old fashioned kind of survey you can possibly imagine where people just make a diary and keep track of what they listen to. Uh, digital, it's much more immediate. We could tell right now how many people are listening uh, to streaming audio on a smart speaker or uh, desktop. We can't tell who you are. Uh, so I don't want anybody to think we're spying on you, but we can tell how many people are actually logged in to listen. Uh, we can tell which stories um, are, are really popular with uh, listeners. And the same with uh, a lot of our content that we now post on places like YouTube. We can tell what kind of uh, interaction that they're getting with, with the audience. But radio is a pretty old-fashioned survey method in this market. In slightly larger markets like Portland, you carry around, around a little thing that looks like a beeper and it electronically records what you're listening to. But that's not uh, technology that's currently used here in Eugene. Very good. Well, it looks like our time is up for today. That went fast. Um, thank you, Jim. It's been an honor to have you speak. I've learned a lot and I'm sure the people who are watching have too. Um, come again. Thank Wonderful. you. Very much. It was great talking to you and I'd be happy to anytime. Thank you very so much. Very good. Appreciate your organization and I thank you for the invitation. Thank you. To the rest of our audience, we hope we see you all back here next month. Stay tuned. Uh, read the newsletter, The Argus. Check your email. We don't send very many. Uh, and look at our website for current events, calls to action, and a treasure trove of our league's work, past and present. Stay safe and be well. Good day.